Thanks for having me. I really wanted to um, first say that that last talk was really fantastic. It's really interesting to see how, you know, actual technology gets integrated into clinical decision systems and into clinical practice um, every day. Um, in this talk, what, did I, what I want you to do is think a little bit about the current state of the art, and in particular in um, artificial intelligence, and how we might bring these techniques into clinical decision support systems. So, um, this is building off, I think, what uh, Dr. Van Wagner said in his talk uh, about the knowledge dilemma. And we know this massive amount of medical knowledge that's building, building up. This is an example from uh, this year, obviously, just the booming output of uh, publications. Uh, we've had, what, uh, almost 2,000, 3,000 publications published per month since the start of this uh, uh, pandemic. And in general, we have this massive amount of uh, medical knowledge. And so the question is, how do we go about coping uh, uh, with that knowledge? So what we are doing in the state of the art today is turning towards AI, and in particular, turning towards uh, machine learning. So you may have a little bit of a background or know a bit about machine learning, but this is just a quick summary slide to show you what that means. So instead of our typical programming uh, that we do, so I would sit down as a computer programmer and write the algorithm, we instead train um, using example data models that are able to do tasks. And the interesting thing here is that by doing this training, we're able to achieve a really uh, incredible performance on a wide variety of tasks. And one of those particular tasks that are, that are interesting is um, natural language processing. So this is an example that you can actually go and try today on, on the internet. It's called reading comprehension. Um, so this is an, a passage from uh, uh, a film, and you, it's just the text about a movie in this case, and then you can just ask questions, natural language questions. For example, in this case, who stars in the Matrix, right? So you can just ask these natural language questions, and uh, the, the machine will read the text and uh, select uh, the correct answer for you, right? And extract that uh, correct answer. Now you. Now, this kind of performance is pretty impressive, and in fact, in common natural language processing uh, tools, we now see that machines, in fact, are better than people. So this is a ranking from something called the, the GLUE benchmark. I don't expect you to understand all these uh, numbers, but that your um, uh, what you can see is that in that red is the performance on humans on various natural language processing tasks. Right. And so Paul, you might say to me, Paul, well, what does this have to do with, with clinical text or uh, uh, clinical decision support? Um, so the, the state of the art uh, is driven by these deep neural networks, driven by uh, machine learning. And um, let me go back here. This, uh, the state of the art is driven by these deep neural networks. Now, these deep neural networks to do this state of the art in natural language process requiring uh, a lot of uh, compute power and actually a lot of money to actually train these models, right? To train these machine learning models needs large uh, uh, computers, multiple weeks to train these things, um, and a lot of data. But because these models are already pre-trained, right? They're trained by uh, large corporations or other big academics groups. We can actually reuse these models and we can reuse them in uh, the space of clinical text. So this is an example of, um, uh, of the application of these large scale um, machine reading models to clinical um, text in, um, and I'll show you what example, example of these tasks in a moment. 
But what you see is that off, on a number of uh, tasks, from extracting entities from clinical text, and this is particularly um, notes from a, a clinical uh, clinical records, uh, to um, extracting concepts, to this uh, natural language inference tasks, you're seeing really uh, phenomenal performance gains. Uh, some with 82% accuracy sometimes. So I'll give you an example of one of these kinds of tasks that you're able to do with these, uh, with these kinds of models. So this medical natural language inference task is given some sort of premise, ALT, AST, and lactate were elevated as noted above. You have a hypothesis, the patient has or abnormal LFTS, and then you have a label. Right, so then you can say, well, is that uh, follow from one another? Is there an entailment there? Is there a contradiction or is it neutral? And your machine is given these two, say, uh, two phrases, the premise and the hypothesis, able to determine uh, the connection between those premises. And So as I was saying, we can apply these large models because we can reuse them, right? We don't have to um, actually train them completely ourselves. So this is an example we've done uh, in my group where what we're trying to do is um, within uh, text, we are trying to extract adverse reactions, right? And here, what we did was we used something called BioVert. So this is one of these large NLP models trained on all of the PubMed, cor uh, um, PubMed cor corpus, 4.5 billion uh, uh, words. And then what we, do, we did was we fine tuned it on smaller data sets. So on data sets um, around uh, um, uh, that are particular towards the extraction of adverse events. And because we were able to reuse these big models, we got you know really good, uh, 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 better performance. So, thirteen percent, ten percent, six percent better performance on the extraction of these adverse events because we could use the, these massive models in the background. But. As we've seen, I think in the in the previous talks, um, clinical knowledge isn't just uh, um, textual knowledge. It's not just the clinical notes. It's not just the scientific publications. It's also structured data coming from your patient records or coming from um, large scale ontologies uh, like SNOMED CT. And so, an interesting question is how can you integrate this cl uh, clinical knowledge? Uh, this clinical text with this kind of clinical knowledge to build these sort of machine learning models. And so this is uh, some of the work we're working on now. So how can we combine these large scale back pieces of background knowledge like SNOMED CT with this text in order to build those kinds of uh, machine learning models? And what's interesting is that we're able to do this. And in fact, uh, some recent work of, uh, of ours is able really to you build these models that's able to look at structured data in combination with text in order to, for example, add, predict additional information that's missing or to improve information retrieval performance in order to actually search through data through structured data better. So this can be perhaps used for uh, searching through uh, all the clinical data you might have. So I'll skip this and um, go to this. So this is this is really the important point: is that this combination of clinical notes, background dictionaries, uh, um, text uh, from uh, text from the literature is an extremely important point uh, way forward. So this is an example of doing medical device surveillance from electronic healthcare records. So here, what they were looking at is hip, hip implants. And what they were trying to do is extract details and reports of complications and pain from electronic uh, healthcare records, right? So you have an uh, EHR, and what you'd like to do is extract these kinds of details and um, bring them up. 
And what's important here is that the in using this combination of, of your background data, of your clinical uh, notes, of your operative reports, and a bit of expertise from clinicians, you're able you're able to perform at um, high levels of performance. In this case, it's ninety seven percent F one measure. And the important point is that by using this combination, we're able to decrease the amount of training data and training time that normally we would need to get this similar kind of performance in these domains. So this is what's known in the, in the literature as this idea of what we call weak supervision. And this is really thinking about what is the totality of the organizational resources that we have um, that we can bring together, combine them in order to train our machine learning models. Now, this is an example from uh, Google, and I'll show you some clinical examples in a, in a second, where the work line, um, yeah, the blue line is a fully supervised system. So you give the, the machine full training data manually labeled by people, and the red line is this weak supervision approach using your SNOMED CT, using uh, some knowledge from expert, experts written in the form of rules, using some statistics. And what you see is that um, using a lot less hand label training data, you're able to essentially uh, beat or get to um, the same level of performance with these um, uh, um, as if you were to have all this hand-labeled data. Now, this is really important, especially in the clinical domain where we don't have a lot of experts, right? Where it's expensive to acquire training data. Um, so let me give you a, a so the, the importance here when we're thinking about this in terms of, of this setting is that all these different sources of knowledge that you've been capturing in EHR systems over time are now being able to be used. And we also might think about different signals that might be useful for us in building these sort of models. So you can talk about rules that we might offer uh, written in EHR systems, other machine learning models that we have, databases or SNOMED CT or ontologies that we might have, or even uh, aggregate statistics that we might collect. So the way this is uh, going is you might say, well, how do we get uh, this information in the system? So recent work, so this is from this year, is about helping people, helping end users actually input the system, uh, input these signals into the system, right? So end user programming for helping so we're, what we're doing is what you're seeing is the, the movement towards using all the knowledge that we've gained, letting the knowledge from uh, experts be very easily integrated into a system in order to be able to apply these kind of machine learning models. And this is what's fascinating, right? So what we're able to do is start to use um, multiple modalities of data to improve performance. So this is a, a very recent paper that just came out um, where the example was you have four different modalities, right? So one where you're trying to classify uh, a radiograph between normal and abnormal, another one where you're trying to uh, use it from a, a 2D view, other one, another task of identifying a, a hemorrhage in an image, another task of kind of uh, trying to predict whether somebody's going to have a, a seizure or not a seizure. Is what you're able to do is use the data from both of these tasks to help you from all these four different tasks to help you perform better on each of the individual tasks. So what is Well, you're breaking up, so we cannot hear you anymore.
And going even further, um, what we're seeing is this sort of supervision, this sort of signal that we're getting. Extremely new sources. So looking far in the future, this is a this is a work where what they did was they attached an eye tracker to somebody, right? And what what you did was as the person looked at a uh, at an image, we used the eye tracker information to help us actually improve the performance of uh, image. With their vision, what we can do is have additional signal that's able to help us improve the performance in this case of um, of image extraction. So this is really interesting, right? We're starting to gather supervision. Not just from uh, the literature, but also from people themselves, from experts themselves. And so, the radiology itself. Mr. Groth, could you? May, yes. Unfortunately, the, your sound is interrupting uh, a lot of times. Maybe you switch off your video. I guess then we get a, a stronger line. Oh. Stronger okay. transfer of your voice. Uh, all right. I'll do that. I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't know what's wrong with uh, No, No problem. It uh, can happen. Um, I hope you got some of what I was saying. <laughs> uh, it's been going quite fast no, no, as well. We got most of it. It was just getting worse. Therefore, I interrupted you. Okay, thank you. All right, so what uh, once uh, by capturing multiple different modalities that you have in a clinical setting, we're now coming up with new techniques, in particular these techniques of weak supervision that are able to actually uh, leverage all that modality, all those different modalities to actually train better machine learning models and also reduce the requirements of labeling by experts, right? And so this really pretends the, the um, implementation of, um, of machine learning and AI in practice. So what does this all mean? I've given you like a whirlwind tour of the state of the art in kind of weak supervision, building these models, being able to use clinical um, clinical text in combination with uh, text or uh, from from the literature, and also being able to use that in combination with multiple modal data. So I really think this is more the future. Right, so we're starting to see these implementations in the literature this year coming forward. But what can you do to think about being uh, being prepared for that? And I think there's a number of uh, premises that I'd like to think about. First is expertise is this critical uh, resource, and we're having machine learning models that are uh, able to improve that use of the expertise that we have in house. Right? So the expertise that sits in your doctors or your clinicians, we're now being able to use that in uh, combination with our models. We're improving our ability to use more and different kinds of signals, right? So the multimodal data, as I said, but I also pointed out the, the um, ability to do eye tracking, for example. So signal capture becomes more imperative. So if you're thinking about building an estate, whatever company you're in or whatever organization you're in, you might want to think about how can I make sure that I'm capturing all the signals that are uh, available. Um, the other question is, uh, the other premise is that multiple context sources buttress um, each other, right? And so it's really important to understand and use the entire data state, right? So I think we saw in the previous talk the importance of getting your data on the same page. And as we improve these machine learning models that are able to 
use all these kinds of content sources, it's really important to have your data as paid in order so that you can apply these things. And lastly, I think uh, it's often thought you need a lot of uh, um, effort to access uh, the state of the art in machine learning. And actually, I hope I saw showed that what we're able to do with this kind of transfer learning is ability to reuse these large models from uh, that are published openly. We're able to apply that today. And so what does that mean? That means the kind of work that we saw in the previous talk about problem formulation, about figuring out where this uh, works in a clinical setting becomes even more important. So that's what I would say is like, I think as we go into the future, our techniques are getting better to reuse the whole data state, but we need to even more emphasize what are the problems we're trying to solve that uh, we can best apply these state-of-the-art results to. So just to wrap up, so we have some time for questions. So I think keeping current requires the use of machines. We're going to have to turn towards AI techniques in order to keep current with what we uh, is coming in the literature and practice. Um, these new approaches to machine learning, these large scale uh, natural language processing models, these large scale image processing models can be applied to clinical data. Uh, the ability to leverage all signals and importantly, the structured data that we have there is, is crucial. So the, your data state becomes critical for the application of these kinds of tools. And it's important to think about how to capture clinical expertise and data. So how do you integrate the knowledge that you have inside your, um, inside your, your clinic, inside your health expertise? How do we think about that? No, not only in terms of capturing that data, but also in defining the problems. So thanks a lot. And I'm sorry for, um, the, uh, on the video problems and I'll stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks a lot for this, for this great presentation. Um, having a look to the chat at the moment, no questions in the chat. You can ask questions in the chat now, or you could also just raise your voice and, uh, and ask Paul directly. Let me make a start. Uh, excellent presentation. I'm always impressed when you're talking, Paul. Thank you very much. So um, I wonder what others have done wrong in the past and why it, it looks so so easy when you present that. Uh, um, and but but uh, big companies, big IT companies like IBM, have failed with, with their uh, with their approaches in in machine learning. And what has changed? And what did they do wrong? And why do they, did they fail? So I tend to think that uh, people try to do, they try to do too much, right? With these ML technologies. I think the, the, the important thing is to find the, the specific problem you're targeting. So for example, uh, where we've seen a lot of success is specific uh, classification problems in radiology, for example. Or in the, the example I gave you about extracting implant details and reports and complications. So that's a, that's a useful problem, right? It requires AI. You need to read the. You're breaking up. Now we lost you again, Paul. Right? What you're trying to do is answer specific um, problems. Uh, that uh, essentially gets information out of the, the wealth of information that you have. So that's what my view is, is trying to essentially solve the whole problem instead of focusing on specific um, uh, use cases that you can apply these techniques to. Uh, 